Welcome to Have a Bible Question Live, where you'll receive a Bible answer to your Bible question. And now, let's study the Bible. All right, so, Troy, confession. Let's clarify something on this, on a question. I'm not, um, I'm not divulging anything. You can't prove anything. I, I'm <laughs> sticking. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um. <laughs> What is what does it mean in the Bible when we say we're to confess? Well, uh, I first thing I I know the answer and you I, know the I, answer, I, but I, I, where I are we going to go with the scripture? I want to go to the scripture first, and the scripture that I immediately go to when I hear that is First John one verse nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now confess our sins means that you need to acknowledge them you and you need to somehow express it in some way now it doesn't say in scripture exactly how that's supposed to take place it is certainly does not say you're supposed to go to a priest or anything like that well is there another type of confession in the bible there is a okay great point there's a because a lot of people get this different. Yeah, there's two different ways of looking at the word confession. There is the confession, the good confession is what we often call it. And that's what you see with the Ethiopian eunuch. You see that in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that uh, uh, through confession we are saved. And what that is, is confessing the Lord Jesus as our, our Lord and Savior. And then there's confession where you are admitting or acknowledging sin um, and stating it, whether it be public or whether it even be between, you know, another brother or something like that. So there's two different senses of the word confession. Yeah, and, and I think that's important because I too many times people will misconstrue those and, and cloud the issue because they're not differentiating the confession for salvation of Jesus Christ, the son of God versus the confessing our faults one to another, which is something we do in the body of Christ to encourage one. Mm -hmm. And there is that confessing. So the plan of salvation, John, my Walter Scott, you know, really pushing the five steps Mm -hmm. uh, of salvation. And, and just for clarification, we're not against the five steps either, but uh, you know, you could call it two steps, trust and obey. If you wanted to, you know, (laughs) you know, here, here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized is five steps, but faith, repentance, confession, baptism is four steps. Just depends on how you teach it, whether it's four or five, two, you know, in there. We're not we're not trying to diminish from that, but that plan of salvation and the process of being added to the church, the confession of Jesus Christ is one. Then there's the idea of confessing our faults to one another. Now, recently, uh, or actually just today, we were recording uh, a question about what if somebody writes it down? Is that actually confessing? Because it, they equate that with verbally telling. So is it okay to write something down in confession? Now, I've had that happen to me. Well, or, I, I think I do it a lot, actually. Yeah. Be, um, be, I, yeah. Go ahead. And, and it's usually somebody that is uh, very reserved, or but they, they have something they want to say, and they'll you know hand me a note and ask me to read it. And it's written out in a confession tone, if you will, where the admittance of wrong, the asking for the prayers of the church, and you're just the messenger of it. But it's it's still impactful, uh, and uh, and and you know exactly what uh, that person is thinking because they asked you to do that. Mm-hmm. But I think it has to do with the personality of the the individual as well as to how. They want to handle it. What if it has to do with the physical aspect of the person? Yeah. Suppose you get somebody who cannot speak. Yeah, that's true too. You know, and how are they going to communicate? And so if they write it down, you know, that's still their words. To which we have a biblical example with Zachariah. Zacharias, the uh, father of John the Baptist, in that he was made mute by God. And when they wanted to call him after his father, he's like, and he gets, he tells him, don't you he, do that. <laughs> he's like, right. you know, he, he writes it down. It says for them to mm-hmm. name him, uh, John. Right. And they were astonished that he would want that. And it was after that, he was able to actually talk and explain to them because God opened his mouth. Right. 
But now did he make a confession to them in the sense of did he express his desires or express something without verbal? It, think about somebody that has to use sign language. You know, mm-hmm. is, is that still confessing? It would be. And I'd yeah. actually argue that the written confession, when somebody publicly responds to the invitation, now that that's that's intriguing. Have you ever had some weird things come up whenever somebody responds to the invitation? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I almost prefer it written out because then at least you can censor it sometimes if need be. Because not every single thing needs to be divert uh, divulged to in public to the congregation. And here we have a practice that they will tell at least one of the preachers they could tell an elder if they didn't want to um you know we would call an elder up there but we don't let people just stand up and start addressing the congregation because historically in congregations that can go very poorly (laughs) Uh, the only time this has ever happened i had a man respond at ackerman he started waving an elder up there before he got there and this is a man that didn't like me because i called him out on false teaching before and so he started waving an elder to come up. I'm thinking, okay, this is weird. Well, of course, I default to the elder, you know, and, and he's sitting there. He's like, I want to apologize, and you know, the way I handle Bible class, blah, 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 and, but I want to address the congregation. I said, well, we typically don't handle it that way. And um, he said, well, I want, to, I, want to, I want to say it with my mouth. I said, um, I called the elder, and I said, he's right here. It, it's his decision in this situation. I'm not, I'm not going to make that. And, um, so this particular elder being on the spot, they weren't going to stop it and call an elders meeting. He made that, that, that quarterback call right there uh, on behalf of the elders. And he, he allowed them to get up and it turned a little ugly. I mean, he was just like degrading me to the congregation. It was his opportunity. He used it as an excuse to get the podium. Yeah. Mm. And that has happened on many occasions in invitations. And so there are many congregations. You're not just going to stand up. And, and you got to think about it this way. If you're doing it in the midst, I'll call it in the midst of worship, not calling it worship in the midst of worship. Would that work for our discussion earlier? Yeah. In the midst of worship, if this takes place, um, do you really want a woman standing up addressing the, addressing the church? That'd be unscriptural if you did. Yeah. And so, um, what's the best way to handle it? Have it written down. I, I remember one preacher, uh, I won't, I know what it was that was said to him and, um, the person responds, he knows them, and um, the confession is made, and it caught him off guard. Uh, have you ever been caught off guard? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, he he was like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. He told me about this. <laughs> Son, I wouldn't confess that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was just so caught off guard. I'm not going into it, you know, and, and, and he, he's like, I'm sorry. It, because it just shocked him. He knew the person. He was close to the person. When he found that out, it was just because we're, we're human beings too. And there's sometimes people come forward. There's some things that I, I advise them. How about we say this? Because I realize for the setting that we're in while they're repentant, it's not for everybody that's there to know the details. Well, guy, let me take it to the other side of the coin. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is when somebody comes forward. Oh, I know where you're going. I agree with you. And they, you know, are asking for the prayers of the church and they don't give any information. They just simply say, I am struggling with personal sin and I just, I need my brethren to pray for me. Let me give you another one. And then, and then the brethren start surmising or guessing what it is and then start talking among each other and start assuming they know what the sin is when they don't know what it is. That friends and brethren is sin itself. So don't do that. Um, the yeah. other one is, uh, I think a lot of times when people say, if I have sinned, you know, no. and then, and then a mission like, or a commission, and then like <laughs> a week later when they're arrested, <laughs> <laughs> well, brother, guess what? You sinned. There were, you knew you had sinned. You just didn't, you just didn't know for sure you were going to be caught. Uh, you were, you know, in and, other words, if I get caught, um, and so, so to clarify, yeah, to clarify, I mean, we mentioned that there, then there are biblical examples As we said, the confession of Jesus Christ, the good confession, Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. But then there's also biblical uh, precedent for confession to the congregation and stuff like confess your faults one another to one uh, one another. How's that go? Uh, James 5, 16. Uh Confess your faults one to another. One to another. That's it. 
And so, you know, that takes that takes effort. Does does that one. passage necessitate though in the worship service? No, not necessarily. That not that is not in the that context could be of worship. Sitting down with elders because I've right. actually had before the discussion come up with an eldership where a man expressed his desire. He wanted prayer as, and this was awkward. I had never done this before. I had prayer with him over the phone though. Our I've minds done were that. there. Yeah, I've done that. And, and we had it immediately. I, I called, do that. Uh, he didn't want to put it off. I called the elders and they said, well, he didn't walk forward. I said, well, does he have to walk forward? There's nothing to say. He has to walk forward. And, um, you know, and so what, we studied it, and biblically, there's nothing to say he has to walk forward for that. And we did let the congregation know to say we are happy to rejoice that he has confessed wrong. And repented. And, and has repented because it did affect the congregation. But there are times, y'all, that that if shepherds are doing their job the way they should, sometimes it's just going to be maybe the elders or a preacher, and you're sitting there, and they want prayers and you're just going to have a prayer right there. It doesn't have to be something that goes before the whole church. And that right. happens more than most members of the congregation normally even know about. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephen Fulton puts yeah. a great example. He says that Simon asked Peter to pray for him in Acts chapter 8, and the other part of that, you know, whenever Simon had committed sin, and Peter Peter called him out on it. And and so, what's interesting, yeah. though, is that he, Simon wasn't told to ask for the prayer. That's right. He was actually commanded to pray for himself. That's right. Mm-hmm. I think we see his heart in there, but was there something required of him at that point in time to ask for the prayer of Peter? No. Because if he had, then that would have been a false guidance given that would have been wrong. He was right. guided by the Holy Spirit to tell him what to do. He was told pray. Yep. And he says, right. will you pray for me? And I think that's just the heart Amen. that he has, that he saw this power they had. He had an admiration for those apostles. That's right. Yeah. So he wanted their prayer. And and I think I think there's something to that too. When and, and that's why when people respond, sometimes I'll pray for them, but a lot of times I call on an elder. Yeah. Now because I've had they some are elders. The shepherds, they're the bishops, they're the overseers. I've had a few occasions and the elder would say, like, and I thought this was interesting. He said, uh one that I might call on that particular service. Um and I, I told him up front, hey, I've, we've been asked for prayer. And um, a couple of the elders looked, would you do that? I think I'll be too emotional. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll be happy to on that, in that mm-hmm. situation. And I can respect why in that situation they wouldn't want me to. It, they wouldn't want to be the one to word that prayer. Because yeah. there's a responsibility of prayer leaders to word prayers appropriately. Yeah. Let me add another aspect to this as well, and that is where religious confusion comes in. Uh, the fact that Simon did ask Peter to pray for him, I think you you clarified that perfectly. It was his heart. That's all it was. There is not a requirement, mm-hmm. just like there's not a requirement to have a shepherd pray over you or anything like that. And so there is no biblical precedent or requirement that you have to go to a specific person in order to confess. In the religious mm-hmm. world, there is false teaching that you can only confess to a certain person. Uh, there are uh, several different religious bodies that have different flavors of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is false. That there's nothing in scripture that says that. In fact, we just quoted the verse, confess your faults one to another. And so, uh, someone who is not of the, uh, you know, the staff or ministry, or they like to use the word clergy or something like that. No, which we don't use. We don't use any of those. We are all members. One, we're all saints. Now, is there a concept, biblical concept, for the the individual to have to at least recognize to the elders that they've taken care of the sin? Absolutely, in their life? because they are the shepherds. They're the ones overseeing the flock. Yeah, they're they they're held accountable to God for the soul. So that's right. One, if you're a repentant, then you would want the elders to know you've gotten your life right. You're not going to be upset that they have inquired. Mm-mm. Um, you can say, "Yes, you're right. I was wrong. I've prayed for that." And, and and if they're not even comfortable that you've prayed for it, I'm going to sit there and say, "Would you want to have prayer with me over that? Because I, I'll be happy for you to pray with me over that." You know, and so that can be handled appropriately. Mm-hmm. So is there is there a concept for elders having to um to know that repentance or forgiveness has been prayed for? Yes. We're not saying that 
they don't have the right there. I, I've seen some people get very defensive about that. Well, that's between me and God. Yeah, if you're part of this congregation, <laughs> if it's, it's a between, public sin, it's a, it's between and you it's and, known yeah. then, then the elders in, inquiry. That's right. Is, is certainly biblical on there. Ray, you got something? Me, I always have something to say. All right, bring it on. <laughs> no, actually, you I, don't. I, I'm I asking. agree with everything that you guys are saying. <laughs> That's yeah. what I have to say. I actually wanted to uh, ask another question to get y'all's thoughts on it is when, uh, it, it could be a two-part question, when you are confessing your sins, is it wrong to out somebody else's sin <laughs> while you're confessing your own sins? <laughs> and if that happens, how would you handle it? Oh, wow. I would say one, if your heart is right, you would not, do you would that. not do it that way because consider, uh, if a brother be token over, uh, if, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you, which are store such, you, which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering right. thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Yeah. That spirit of meekness would be that you're not going to just like out them. If you're talking about coming before the church now, if it involves, and I've actually, uh, Ray, we've handled this here where one of our members sins here involved. And, and this happens a lot, by the way, especially with teenagers, mm-hmm. when, when one of the teen, one of the ones in the youth group, something happens and parent finds out about it. So they're trying to correct it and then come to find out it involves somebody else in the youth group. And so now the eldership is like, okay, now we got to call the parents into that and, and so in the process of repentance, can it cause somebody to be outed? It, yes. But that's where in the spirit of meekness, there is discretion in how we handle this. Not cover up, but discretion. Because what is our goal in all this? Repentance, forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And, and members don't like to hear this, but everything that goes on isn't always their business. Everything that happens is not always my business. Ray, is everything that happens always your business? I hope not. Yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> It's not always mine. And and yeah. I think there's some comfort we ought to find and, and also gratitude that our elders have to face a lot and deal with a lot. And I believe oftentimes, uh, and I think Gary, not Gary, Glenn, Collie picked a perfect title for a book uh, about how to handle situations with elders. And it, the title of the book is Awake at Night because there's a lot of times that there's nosy members that I wonder what's going on over there. I want to know. What, what, you know. And, and it's like if only they understood that when those elders have to know about this and handle it, there is a burden upon those shoulders. And how do they handle these situations? I'm not trying to go too far from your question there, Ray, but uh, elders have to handle this stuff delicately to try and not cause further damage and to help make the opportunity for forgiveness for growth and to bring everyone closer to God in the process. And I've seen just the opposite happen. I've seen where elderships have made decisions to not divulge information or to protect a person because what it would do, you know, to lots of other people. And then, uh, the congregation or some people start making accusations against them and everything else. And they don't understand. They don't have all the information. They don't understand what's going on. And so, so where was the fault? Yeah. They should have divulged the information. Right. Yeah. And that's my point is no, they shouldn't. I know, Instead, I know where you, what and, you meant, but I want you to clarify that. The, yeah. the congregation should have trust in, and, uh, understanding of their eldership that, that they're sometimes looking they out know for, more. They know more. And, and the, what you mentioned a while ago, the evil surmisings that come up is just Ooh, as sinful. That's exactly what I said. Yeah, yeah. that's what you I were like talking way, about. I like the yeah. way, way he, he brought your point back evil at Evil surmisings. You, right? Because that shows that your heart is not where it should be because you're, you're just wanting to find out ri- the dirt on everything, uh-huh. you know, and that Whispering, you gossiping, wrong. and yep. backbiting, yep. you know. Uh, uh, Devouring one great. another. Well, yeah. Let me ask you this. If, if Ray and I have a fault with one another, and I think about that a lot because you'd be amazed how many preachers in the brotherhood end up at odds with one another. Yeah. Especially and, when they're working side by side. And yeah, when you have like a, a youth minister and a preacher or an associate of preacher, I don't even know what you call us at this point other than just preachers, Ray. I, I you've referred to yourself as associate. Sometimes I, I just see you as one of the preachers. 
That's how I refer to it. Yeah, folks. we just leave it out in the open that we don't like each other to begin with, and then there's no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. But but if Troy, if Troy, if Ray and I have an issue with one another, ideally, should it even go to the elders? That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says you're supposed to work it out among yourself. Matthew 18. Yeah, Matthew 18 is that we ought to, if we're if we're both Christians, we ought it should it should stay between us. It shouldn't ever go anywhere else and if the eldership can help a situation get worked out then it's not everybody's problem and that would be some of the downside of some situations that end up coming to light because of the invitation (laughs) when it could have been handled a little bit better yeah yeah. going to the elders and not causing questions and i think that's sometimes why some people are hesitant to walk forward now i i I heard one congregation i found this interesting that they had a challenge that nobody walks forward alone. Hmm. Does that make sense? That um, they, if I forget how it worked, but they had a challenge that if you see somebody walking forward, somebody go sit with them. Somebody walk forward with them. Not that you both have to respond to the invitation, but don't leave that person sitting there alone. I thought that was very interesting uh, of an approach. I've seen it. I've seen it uh, in several congregations. Um, I saw it happen with a youth group, and I was, I was like, man, I got a bunch youth. of folks coming. It happened to Market Street, I think, maybe. Yeah. I was like, wow, I really pricked the heart of their youth group. And it was one. It was one that responded, but they – I forgot they, all about that, but yeah. They, they went forward uh, as a group because they loved that individual, and they and they knew about the issue that they were dealing with, and they I just went to the support. Too. Yeah. I, th- I, I was a – I was impressed. I, I forgot about it actually until now. I can't remember where that was. But same way, even with uh, adults that go forward at Margaret Street, every time somebody's come forward, there is always, um, whether it be a male or a female, there's going to be those that come up and support them. And Have you ever had that awkward that like you extend the invitation, somebody steps out, you think, oh, they're coming and they're going to the bathroom? Well, no, because they're going the other direction. But I have had them actually. Um, come down the aisle towards me and then turn into the aisle because they were coming from the bathroom all right it happens worse on the side where our pews are angled oh okay because if you're getting out it looks you're in afford momentum oh gotcha so you're like, oh well and let then, me tell you one of the coolest things i ever saw in my life was you know margaret street's got a balcony and so i offered the they invita- repel off we don't no. do that <laughs> and we don't have a choir um no i said repel i know we don't have but people associate balconies also with that oh but. okay i got you so we had uh, a brother a now brother who was sitting in the balcony and i preached my sermon and you this is going back to what we were talking about earlier how people respond is that it's not always the you know the sermon that did it is there's things that worked on their heart and i watched him get up out of his seat and jump up out of his seat and go down the stairs and then come straight down that front aisle, man. Wow. I know it was just the most, and I mean, as soon as he got there, I just, and he was, he was responding to be baptized and man, I gave him the biggest hug. Was he out of breath? No. It's was just he the, like that pitcher running in from the, uh, from the bullpen on the back of the, <laughs> <laughs> it was just great. You no, know, it there's that been, dedication yeah. and everything. Well, so. honestly, when you say that, that's the first time I've ever thought about that if you have a balcony, it can change the invitation because they have got to come down. And I, I never considered that. It's interesting. My wife mentioned it, and you're, she's right. Um, the person that's going to lead the closing prayer, but chooses, <laughs> At the, wrong chooses the invitation to walk forward. And it's like, <laughs> I think they got closing prayer, but, but are they responding? And then it's always awkward. Have you ever, have you ever started to walk away during the invitation? Cause you thought it was the last verse and it wasn't. No, never done that. Well, maybe I'm the only dumb one. 